This is my Bible. It is the Word of God and the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am where the Word says I am. I am seated right now in the heavenly realms in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. And I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive. My life will be changed for the better. And I will never. You got to believe it. Say, I will never be the same again. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we're going to be going back and forth between the Old and the New Testament. So we're going to be in a couple places. They're going to put all the scriptures on screen and just follow along your iPhone, iPad, Bible, whatever you brought with you. Now, we, we kicked off this series in Malachi chapter 3. And Malachi 3, I mean, all of Malachi is a prophetic book. And so there are things in Malachi, he's dealing with the present tense, but there are things in which he's speaking to the future. And a verse that particularly speaks to the day in which we live is Malachi chapter 3 and verse 18, where he says, you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. And of course, we think to ourselves, wow, that, those are the days we're living in. But I've got good news, bad news, however you see it. Good news is, you know, the worse it gets, the sooner we get to the return of Christ. But on the other hand, you know, we're, we're entering in more into these days where we see the distinction between those who serve God and those who do not. And last week, I, I, I stressed, I emphasized the importance of exercising your faith. And a lot of times, I've grown up in church all my life, and I've seen people and they've, they've been to church, they've been out of church, they've, they've been in church, and they wait until there's a major catastrophe to exercise their faith. They, they wait until there's a horrible problem to exercise their faith, and then it's, it's really difficult. And last week we learned that we're to live this life of faith every single day. We're to walk by faith every single day. And in your everyday life, your everyday circumstances, you have got to find things in your life to exercise your faith, to build up your faith, to strengthen your faith. You know, sometimes new people come, people come, and, you know, the criticism is, well, they, they, they talk about finances. Well, what Jesus did for us includes our finances, praise God. And also, I'd rather exercise my faith with Jessica and I's finances than on our physical bodies. Does that make sense? And so you understand our perspective. Why, why are we so fanatical about exercising our faith in the everyday matters of life, including our finances? Well, exercising my faith with money is a lot better than exercising my faith in a life and death physical situation. Does that make sense? But see, if every day I'm exercising my faith in terms of Jessica and I's marriage, in terms of parenting, raising the two girls that God has blessed us with, if we're exercising our faith in terms of the church, we're exercising our faith in terms of finances, right? Well, we're, we're strong, we're strong in the Lord. You know, used to in the 90s, when my dad talked about that, he'd use a, it was a doll in the 90s, and it could stretch. It was called a stretch Armstrong. You could stretch its arms, and eventually it'd go back to normal. Well, that was up in his office, and I thought, man, last week I thought, I'm going to use stretch for my illustration, well, it didn't dawn on me that after 15 years, stretch might not stretch so good anymore. <laughs> and so I went to stretch him, his arms in faith, and his arms broke off. <laughs> well, <laughs> you have believers, and they're not exercising their faith on a regular basis, right? And Satan shows up to steal, to kill, to destroy, and they're like, here we go. And their arms fall off. And so this, this is so important. And, you know, you can come and you can mentally agree with what I'm saying, what my father is saying, but you have got to get into God's word for yourself. You've got to study it for yourself. You've got to decide what you believe 
So when that, that moment comes in life where you've got to stand, you know what you believe. Now first today we're going to see in the Old Testament, first we're going to see that Melchizedek was a priest of God Most High. You know, spiritual connections matter. R.W. Shambach used to say, find a pastor in less trouble than you are. You know, and I've been around some guys, and it's, it, it almost turns into a bragging contest, like, who is more messed up? Well, when I, my father gives me the opportunity to travel and to hear from other pastors, at the top of my list is, who in the United States of America is the most messed up? Who in the United States is the biggest failure? I mean, that's not my criteria. You know, this week, Aaron and I went to something. That was not our criteria for what we went to. Your spiritual connections matter. Genesis 14 Beginning in verse 18, and this is dealing with the life of Abraham, it says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, Salem later became Jerusalem, brought out bread and wine. And for those of you that you know, know, know your Bible, know your stuff, you're thinking bread and wine sounds like communion. And the reality, the stark reality that we see in Abraham's life and the life of some of the others that lived in the Old Testament, like Enoch, for instance, they had greater insight into the things of God that we as Christians often have today with Genesis, the Revelation, and all of God's Word. They understood, they grasped more than we grasp today. And this is why Paul tells us in Galatians of Abraham that the Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. You know, and Moses hadn't been born yet, so Abraham did not have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He didn't even have that. And yet, he understood what God was going to do. And he understood something that many Christians struggle with, and that is the fact that we are justified by faith in God. Verse 18 continued, he was priest, Melchizedek, priest of God Most High. So he was a priest, a servant of the same God that Abraham served. And he blessed Abraham, saying, blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham, Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Abram, his name was later changed to Abraham and partly because God was helping him with what he and his wife were saying. That's a, that's a different message. But you notice it says in Melchizedek that he, he blessed Abram, Abraham and he pronounced the blessing upon Abraham. You know, my father said a few weeks ago in the 9 a.m. service that there just came a point where 3 John 2 got into his heart, and I would say the same thing is true concerning my life. You know, John, he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was a part, there were the 12, but Peter, James, and John, they were the three disciples that were closest to Jesus. He, he lived to be an old age. The Romans tried putting him to death. They were unsuccessful. They eventually put him on the island of Patmos where he wrote Revelation, but he had a true pastor's heart. He loved the people of God. And in 3 John 2, he says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou would prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. And my father said, and I would say, that that is our heart's desire for you. We want to see you prosper in every area of life. So why do we sometimes talk about the things we do? Why do we sometimes use the illustrations that we do? Why do we talk about things like getting an education or getting training for your life calling, your life occupation? Why do we talk about waiting for marriage? Why do we talk about not dating crazy or psycho and marrying the right person? Why do we talk about those things? Is it because like we, th we sit around all week and we're like, man, we want to be really discouraging this Sunday. We want to just come in and have a message that everybody's like, man, that's a bummer. We love you. We love you. And because of this, what we do, we see the, the results of people doing certain things. And so when we come in and say, avoid that, avoid this, avoid that, we're just, we're trying to point people in the right direction. And notice Melchizedek blessed Abraham. He blessed him. Didn't curse him. He blessed him. And that's our heart's desire for you, that you be blessed in every area of life. And then it says, in the, at the end of verse 20, then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. And so Abraham's gift shows us that he believed God. Last Sunday I said, faith is taking action on the word of God. You see, you could, I could ask you after the service, do you agree with all of this? A lot of people could, could say yes, they, they, and what they mean is they, 
they mentally agree with everything in the Word of God. But then a separate question would be, well, are you living it out in your life? The Bible, for instance, says that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, so what we do with our body does matter. I could agree mentally that I ought to live with my body in such a way as to honor God. The question is whether or not somebody is living that way. Second, we see that Jesus Christ is our high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Six times. You know, if the Bible says something once, that's something. If it says it twice, that's confirmation. If it says it three times, four times, five times, six times, God is really driving something home to us. And when a lot of times we think of the priests, or we think of the priesthood, we think of Moses' brother, Aaron, who was from the tribe of Levi. We think of the priests, or we think of in the New Testament when Jesus would go and teach at the temple and there would be priests there that we think of those priests. But the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is our high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And this, this is important. In Psalm 110 and verse 4, David prophesied, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you, he's referring to Jesus, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And we'll go, let's go to the New Testament. Hebrews 5, beginning in verse 1. Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And so when he's talking about the priesthood here, he's talking about the priesthood of Aaron and those that were descended from Aaron, that priesthood. Verse 4, no one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. Verse 5, so Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. There he's, he's quoting his psalms. And he says in another place, we just read it, Psalm 110.4, you, speaking of Jesus, are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And so this is important conceptually. You know, just between services, my, my father said to me, he said, you know, Austin, a lot of times people, and speaking of us, we in general, we read a lot of books about the Bible. But how often do we spend just reading the Bible? You know, and having been in higher education for a long time, having been in school a long time, you know, I can... I can totally relate to that. I mean, I know guys, and they base what they believe off what some theologian said. You know, you talk to them, they're not quoting the Bible, they're quoting John Calvin. John Calvin this, John Calvin that. Well, 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 okay, 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 but what does the Bible say? And, but that's true for any of us. You know, it's great when some new book comes out, some bestseller comes out, but, you know, we're, we're, to, we're to check everything with the Word of God, but what is the Word that brings us life? It's this right here. Whether you read it like this or read it on your iPad, it is the Word of God that brings us life, not reading the latest, greatest bestseller. And so this conceptually is important. To better understand Jesus, to better understand his role in your life, you should go to the Old Testament, study the life of Abraham, and study who is this guy, Melchizedek. I mean, there are a lot of people, and they're walking around, and they think that God, God's mad at them, God hates them, God wants to hurt them, harm them. You know, I said last, last Sunday, I could see eyebrows going up, that, you know, you have people, and they say that, that God gets glory when you're not feeling well, and God gets glory when you're dying, and God gets, God gets glory when you can't pay your bills. And I said, that's not what brings glory to God. What brings glory to God is somebody being healed. What brings glory to God is somebody being set free. What brings glory to God is somebody that could not pay their bills. They met Jesus, who is a high priest, not in the order of Aaron, but in the order of Melchizedek, and now they are blessed in every area of their lives. That is what brings glory to God. And see, we, we conceptually have, people have trouble with this, and so they're walking around, and they're telling everybody at work, you know, I got the flu, but I, I'm just suffering for the Lord. I got the flu, and I'm bringing glory to God. Oh, let the Lord be magnified. Let the Lord be magnified while they're taking Theraflu. Now, if the flu really brought joy and glory to God, you would stop taking medicine, right? Because being more sick 
having more of the flu symptoms would bring greater glory to God. You can use your brain when you come to church. We can use our common sense. God gave us common sense. It's a gift. You know, sometimes we'll joke behind the scenes. I'll joke with Aaron. You know, sometimes when somebody won't say something to my dad, they'll say it to me. They won't say it to my dad or to my mom or to me or Jessica. Then they'll say it to Aaron. You know, and they'll, they'll tell Aaron, well, my gift is. I'm always like, well, why isn't that a gift in the Bible? You know, when Paul talks about gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, that gift isn't there. You know, she says her gift is that. Well, why, why, why no one ever saying their gift is cooking? <laughs> Something that might be helpful to her husband, amen. Sorry, that's, that's free, that's bonus. But coming to the Word, setting aside religious thinking or indoctrination is so important, and just seeing what it says. He is a high priest in whose order? In the order of who? Melchizedek. So then going back to Genesis, finding out about Melchizedek gives us insight into who Jesus is in our lives. When, when Abraham showed up to Melchizedek, Melchizedek didn't make him sick. He didn't say, man, God has blessed you. Look at all this blessing. I'm going to take it all from you. You need to be broke, Abram. See, going to Genesis and seeing who he is gives us insight into who Jesus is in our lives. Verse 7 here in Hebrews 5. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. That's his father. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. You know, a big part of this, and we'll get more to it, is is humility, coming to the conclusion that God is God, I am not. And God knows how I should live. He knows more about how we should live than we do. And when it comes to experiencing the best of all that God has for us in any area of life, God's the one that we should be going to saying, how do I live? And this can be hard in our culture today where everybody thinks they know everything. They've been taught in school that every, everybody's truth is just as good as everybody else's. He heard him because of his reverent submission. Verse 8, although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And just, just let that sink in your head. He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. You know, there are some people you listen to and they'd, they'd have you believe that you don't need to obey God. Well, you know, this past week, I mean, I was reading 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Romans, all over Paul's writings, and I just wanted to start writing down and counting up all the times he says obey or obedience. And think about this. Jesus obeyed the Father, and he always, in the Gospels, talked about how he was doing the will of who? His Father in heaven, doing what his Father wanted him doing, saying what his Father wanted him saying. If Jesus obeyed, why would we think we wouldn't have to? And if he obeyed, why would we think, I don't have to, but I'm going to call myself a Christian, which means a follower of Christ. He obeyed the Father, but I'm, I'm not, no, 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 I know better. I'm going to do, live this way. I'm not going to obey God, but I'm a follower of Jesus. And see, so, you know, you can get the bumper sticker, you can have the t-shirt, you can, you know, have Jesus rocks on the back of your car, whatever, but we got to obey him. Verse 10, and was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now remember, God's will for our lives is shalom, which means total well-being in every area of life. Yes, he died so that we could be forgiven of our sins, but that is just one aspect of the atonement. You know, between worship and the beginning of the message, we sang again, I read out of Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is not just talking about forgiveness of sins. It's talking about that he took upon himself our sicknesses. And Peter, quoting that in the New Testament, says in 1 Peter 2.24, by his wounds we have been healed. So he didn't just pay the price for our sins. He paid the price for any sickness. He paid the price for poverty. And as I said, he paid the price so that you could be free in every area of our lives. But see, you have got to come to the Word of God. I can tell you about it, but you've got to come to the Word of God, see it for yourself, let it get down, deposit it in your heart so you believe it. You believe it. 
See, Jesus said, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And any time in my life I find myself and I'm, I'm struggling with this thing of believing in my heart, that just means I need more, more word in my life. Third, we are heirs of Abraham and we have a high priest just like Abraham. Now, if I didn't pronounce heir properly, and when I say heir, I mean H-E-I-R, you know, my wife teases me that for somebody that did a lot of English and has a master's in English that I, 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 I have sometimes don't say stuff the way I should, no, but I'm a, I was born in Texas, I can't help it, born in Fort Worth in 1982. But number three, we are heirs of Abraham, and we have a high priest just like Abraham. Galatians 3.29, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And of course, we know that because of the Jews, that Abraham has natural, physical descendants. But once again, another New Testament concept to just get into your mind, wrap your mind around, is that because of Jesus Christ, we are the spiritual children of Abraham. We are the spiritual seed of Abraham. He is the father of our faith. If you belong to Christ, Galatians 3.29, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is why Paul says in Romans 4, Abraham is the father of us all. Now, what is the definition of a heir? What's the definition? First, an heir is a person legally entitled to the property or rank of another on that person's death. An heir is a son. You know, I am an heir of my father. And so that entitles me to certain rights. That entitles me to certain things. When the, the time comes, many decades, decades from now, and he, he goes to be with the father, <laughs> I'm an heir of what? The estate. So that influences then how I see myself. And think about this. We are the spiritual seed of Abraham, but you've got a lot of Christians walking around, and they're talking about theologian so-and-so, they're talking about Job. I like Job. He's a nice guy. Went through some stuff. Nobody ever reads the end of Job. I mean, that'd be like going to see Star Wars Episode One, and then not seeing two, three, four, five, and six. And one is not a very good movie. <laughs> Who's that guy, Anakin? Who's Darth Vader? You got to see the other movies. You know, people talk about Job, they never get to the end. God blessed him with twice as much and a new wife that wasn't negative and critical. I just love throwing that out there. I, you know, I, I, yeah, I put it on my iPhone, you know. It's that time of year, mention that again. But you, you got people walking around and they're Job this, Job that, Job that. Well, from the New Testament, we see the truth from what Paul communicated that we are the spiritual seed of who? Job? Abraham. So whose life should I study? Whose life should I conceptually understand? Who should I imitate? See, we got to lift up our eyes. We've got to get this, and you've got to get it into your heart. A synonym of heir is successor or beneficiary. Second definition, a person inheriting, and I love this, continuing the legacy of a predecessor. You see, if the, when the time comes and my father goes to be with God, if I do something different, then that means I'm not an heir. To be a true heir to my father, it means I'll stand right here and do what he did for all the days of his life and preach the same thing he preached. Otherwise, I could call myself an heir, but I wouldn't really be living as an heir. And so as Christians, the spiritual seed of Abraham, we are to live our lives in such a way that we are continuing the legacy of who? Abraham, which is what? Faith. F-A-I-T-H. Living by faith, believing the word of God, saying what God says, and walking in what? The blessing of the Lord. And I, I've, the young people have heard me say this this year, don't reinvent the wheel. You know, when you go to school, they're telling you, oh man, your parents are clueless, they don't know nothing. Not at high school, but by the time you get to college. And there's just this thing out here in our culture where, you know, my, my generation's problem is we think we know everything. We don't. And we, we have this kind of thing that, well, I, man, we've got Google, 
and we've got Wikipedia. I, I'm always telling the high school students, just because it says it on Wikipedia doesn't mean it's true. But we, man, we got Google, we got Wikipedia, we got iPhones, we got iPads. And what we're doing is, because of Twitter and social media, we are all ingesting an incredible amount of information every day, but really how much of it is helpful information? How much of that information is helping us to go to the next level in our lives or whatever it is we do, whatever our occupation is? How, how much of that information is really helping us to improve our lives? And, and I'm not saying that to mean there's nothing wrong with it, that posting on Facebook's a sin. I post on Facebook all the time. That, that would make me the biggest sinner here. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we have this kind of attitude going on in our culture that because of all this information that we're swimming in, that we know a lot. But I think when it really gets down to it, once again, and my father talked about this at nine, we need to have a spirit and attitude of humility. That's why we all need elders, people that we say, you know what, they know something, and I need to hook my wagon to theirs and learn from them. And so because of all this information, we think we know everything. But our, our knowledge is what? Surface level. There's no depth to it. You know, and you, know, you hear about students in high school, and they're, reading, they're supposed to be reading Charles Dickens. Nobody reads Charles Dickens. They go to sparknotes.com. I see, I see them in the back. They're like looking the other way. No, it's all right. My wife was the biggest sparknoter of all. So her, her strength was math and science. But my point is, just because you go to Spark Notes and it tells you what a Dickens novel was about, you don't know diddly squat about Charles Dickens. And so, man, you know, you could have the biggest Bible. You know, sometimes you see them, they're like this big. I mean, you could, you could, but that doesn't mean you know anything about what's inside of it. Does that make sense? And so we are the spiritual seed, the heirs of Abraham. So question. Who should we imitate? Who should we model? Who should we live like? Abraham. I, I love Deborah. I love Esther. Those are people in the Bible, by the way. See, that's to illustrate <laughs> my point. I love Mary, Jesus' mom. But who are we to imitate? Abraham, the father of us all. He lived by faith. And thousands of years before Jesus ever came, he was justified by faith with no Bible. I think we could learn something from Abraham. In Galatians 3, 13 and 14, we're reminded by Paul that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. And if you want to know what that is, just go to Deuteronomy 28 this week. And in Deuteronomy 28, the first part's blessing, but the second part's the curse of the law. And it's some scary stuff. Scary. I think one, we should just do that one Sunday and walk through it verse by verse. Because you go to that, what, G, what Paul says here in Galatians, we have been redeemed from that. Which means, if I've got any of that in my life, I have conceptually misunderstood who I am in Christ Jesus and how I ought to be living my life in Christ Jesus. We've been redeemed from it. So that he redeemed us Verse 14, in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to who? The Gentiles, that's you and me, through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. But see, unless you live like Abraham, you will not experience the blessing of Abraham. And Paul says here, you might. He says the same thing in 2 Corinthians 8. He says, excel in the grace of giving, and that Christ became poor so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. But he doesn't say it's going to happen. He doesn't say it will happen. He says, you might. See, whether or not it happens in your life is up to you. So unless you live like Abraham, you will not experience the blessing. Christ redeemed us so that the blessing might. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 13. Hebrews 6 beginning in verse 13, it says, When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. Notice, notice how the word bless is repeated again and again. Bless, 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 bless. See, some people think about God. They're thinking about their relationship with God, and they're thinking curse, hate, messed up, messed up, cursed, hate, dislike, distance, 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 lack, lack, not enough. But you go to Abraham, Bless, 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 
bless. You know, God told Abraham to lift up his eyes. We've got to lift up our eyes as believers. Bless, bless, bless. I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. And so when the Bible talks about waiting, about waiting patiently, it's talking about seed time and harvest. Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to the argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs. That's you. That's me. We just saw that in Galatians. God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to you, to me, of what was promised, and he confirmed it with an oath. God did that so that by those two unchangeable things, his oath, his promise, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be encouraged. See, we ought to come to church and get encouraged. Because of everything that Jesus has done for us and God has done for us, we ought to be encouraged. Take heart. Now, I've been saying all year, your best days are ahead of you. But you've got to lift up your eyes. You've got to believe it. You've got to believe it's true concerning in, in your life. You've got to see it. Have eyes to see it. So that we may be encouraged. That's my job. To encourage you. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Firm and secure. Our hope. What? It enters. What's that? Our hope. What is our hope? Our hope is in Jesus Christ. In him we have eternal life. And we are anchored safely in him. Our hope enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus who went before us has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Once again, to grasp who Jesus is, to grasp who he is in our lives, to grasp, to understand, to get what he wants to do in your everyday life, you've got to know who Melchizedek was. You've got to understand who Abraham was. We have a high priest just like Abraham's. And what kind of high priest was he? Let's go back now to Genesis 14, verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram. See, so that, that should be my relationship with you. I bless you. I bless you. And when you come to me with a load, I should tell you how to remove that load from your life. When you come to me with a burden, I should, I, should come, I should help you remove that burden from your life. When you come to me and you say, Austin, I'm sick, I should pray with you to be healed, to receive what Jesus already did on the cross for you. My prayer should not be, God, heal this person by killing them and taking them to be with you in heaven. But I've heard those prayers. And there are times when somebody's fought a long, hard battle, and they're at the end of the road, and you know what? They just decide in their, their heart, their spirit, man, they're ready to go be where? With God and streets of gold. But y'all are all young folk. So my job is not to say, give up, throw in the towel. God's trying to teach you something. You know, you going backwards, 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 failing, 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 being sick, 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 brings the Lord to God. My job is to show you the gospel, which is good news, not bad news, and my job is to pray with you and to bless you and to show you how to come up out of those circumstances and to point you in the right direction, not to make you feel better about going in the wrong direction. He is a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Genesis 14 and verse 19, he blessed Abram saying, blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who gave your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So we see here in Genesis 14 that Abraham's priest, Melchizedek, he did two things in the life of Abraham. Number one, he received Abraham's tithe. Number two, he then blessed Abraham. That's what he did. He received Abraham's tithe. He then blessed Abraham. And then we see here that Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything, a tenth of the increase that God had blessed him with. And it was common. It was common when you had been victorious in war to give part of the spoils of war to show honor. You know, what we do with our money reflects, it shows what we really value and honor in our life. That's why when the wise men came to Jesus, they knelt before him with precious gifts. That's why when Mary anointed Jesus before his burial, she anointed him with perfume that John tells us costed a year's wages. See, how did Mary feel about Jesus? Well, we know how she felt. Why? Because of the gift that she presented to Jesus. See, see, and you know, and once again, I'm not judging. 
But I'm, my father taught me to constantly evaluate. So when I worship God, I want to I wanna worship God in the way I worship him with 100%. When I, when, I, when I come to church, whether it's to do what I do or to sit and listen to my father, I want to do that with 100%. When, when I give, I want to do that with 100%. Whatever I do, I want to give God my best. Why? He gave us his best on the cross. And we've got to get our minds right about this. A man walked up to me after the service last week, and he said, Austin, today I gave the largest tithe I've ever given. And we've, we've learned, we see in Malachi, we've seen in other places. You know, Paul says that when we, we sow sparingly, we reap sparingly. And if you come to me and say, Austin, I don't know why I'm reap, reaping sparingly. I'm going to point you to what the Apostle Paul said. Austin, I don't know why my wife hates my guts. Well, let's go to the scriptures and evaluate how you've been treating your wife. And so if you'll have the, once again, we're talking a lot about perspective in this message. See, if I, I come to God and I hear what the word says about giving, giving tithes and offerings, and my income is $100 a week and so I give 10, well, what does his word promise us? That he's going to bless us that he's going to protect us, that he's going to make sure the fruit of our lives doesn't spoil? What then if my tithe then goes to $50 a week? Well, that's a tithe of what? $500. Well, giving, I give my tithe of the $500, which means I've got $450 left over. Is that or is that not better than $90? See, this is a perspective issue. If then I, I'm blessed and then I give $100 a week, what, what, what's left over? 900, then $500 a week, then $1,000. You see, it's perspective. It's perspective, it's perspective, it's perspective. And so that's why when you come to God's word, you've got to see, as Jesus said, as the prophet said, you have got to have eyes to see, you've got to have ears to hear. It is about perspective. See, we're just trying to talk you into the plan of God. You know, and I pointed out earlier in the year, you know, a lot of people are talking about sacrificial giving. God's plan is tithes and offerings. We give God 10%. We give offerings above and beyond as led by the Holy Spirit, which then leaves us free to do what? Enjoy the rest. Just like Abraham enjoyed the rest. Just like he did. So we got to lift up our eyes. In Genesis 12, God told Abraham he would bless him. In Genesis 14, where we've been today, we see that he tithes, and then what happens? Abraham is blessed. Abraham's action. His obedience brought into manifestation the blessing that God had promised. Melchizedek blessed him and said, blessed be Abram. So we see here that there is a lapse of time. There is a period of time. There is what we call lag time between God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 and the blessing showing up. So what we're talking about is manifestation. And everybody wants manifestation, but Everybody's not interested in understanding how it works and what we need to do to receive the blessings that God has for us. And so this is how it works. God makes a promise, and then at some point down the road, you have fulfillment. But what are we supposed to do in between? We're supposed to obey God. We're supposed to live his life. As James said, we're supposed to be doers of the word of God. So why do you have Christians... And they might know the promises of God, believe the promises, confess the promises, but there's never any manifestation in their life. It's been five years, 10 years, 15 years, and the manifestation is missing. Well, they've left out the in-between ingredient, which is obedience. See, the kingdom of God is about seed time and harvest, and harvest takes time. So even for Abraham, here's the promise. You have the manifestation in Genesis 14, but you have all this period of time in between, seed time and harvest. You know, give God as much time as you gave the world. Give God as much time as you gave living for Satan. Give God as much time. Well, I came to church one time. You're going to have to do something. You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to read your Bible. You're going to have to make some changes to your life. And then what comes over time? Manifestation. But growing up in church, I've seen it again and again. Somebody comes, they get excited, they're, they're planting, they're sowing, they're working the field, and then Satan shows up, like we learned last Sunday, to steal, kill, and destroy. They get, they get upset at God, they get bitter at God, they, they throw in the towel, and they decide, 
rats, and then they go the opposite way. Well, what's the other direction? Their manifestation. They are walking away from their blessing, from their harvest, from their manifestation. What takes you from promise to fulfillment? What takes you from promise to manifestation? Faith, which is taking action on the Word of God. Which for Abraham here in Genesis 14, how does he take action? Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya. I know, he puts dockers and loafers on. They build a fire. He strums a song with Melchizedek. Kumbaya, my Lord. How does he take action in Genesis 14? He gives. He presents his tithe to who? Melchizedek, the priest. And then what happens? Blessing. See, I, can, I could stand here and say, you can do nothing. You can come once a year and you'll be blessed, but I'd be lying to you. And in our hearts, you know I'd be lying to you. So let's just agree, you don't want me to lie to you. What if he had not lived by faith? What if he had not taken action? What if he had not tithed? He would not have received the blessing of Genesis 14. How do we know he believed God? We know by what he did. Faith, which is taking action on the word of God. As James says, tells us in James in the New Testament, Abraham believed God and God credited it to him as righteousness. See, how do I know somebody's getting it? How do I know somebody believes God? Well, they come, but they're peripheral. They're not engaged. But over time, they get engaged. Over time, they start helping. Over time, they go from, you know, not worshiping God to worshiping God. Over time, they go from not being a giver to being a giver. And then what happens? Manifestations start showing up. Blessings start showing up. Manifestation, manifestation. And they go from having no power to obviously walking in the power of God he, you believe but how do we know somebody believes by what they do and James tells us that of Abraham his faith was made complete according to James by what he did and his faith and his actions were working together and boom here comes the manifestation but what if he hadn't believed God now let's go and end in the New Testament Hebrews 7 Melchizedek, Hebrews 7, beginning in verse 1, Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the son of God, he remains a priest forever. And the, the author of Hebrews there, he's not saying anything spooky or weird. He's just being matter of fact. Je Melchizedek shows up in Genesis 14 and he never shows up again we never hear about him again until the book of Hebrews but he's like the son of God a priest forever verse 4 just think how great he was even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder now the law requires the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people that is their brothers even though their brothers are descended from Abraham and so once again another concept all of Abraham's descendants are to live the way Abraham lived. Whether you're a Jew living under the law, under the priesthood of Aaron, or you're a Christian living under the covenant, living with the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ. Abraham's children are to live like Abraham. So whether you were a Jew living back in the day under the law with Aaron as your high priest, you were to live like Abraham by faith and to present your tithes to who? The priest. But uh, for us as... Christians under the new covenant were to live like who? Abraham. This man, verse 6, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham. That's speaking of Melchizedek. And blessed him who had the promises. So if Abraham tithed, both his natural and spiritual children should tithe. Christ is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. In the order of Melchizedek. And so just think about it. Well, why would he then do in our lives anything different than what Melchizedek did? Melchizedek did what? He received Abraham's offering, and then he did what? He blessed him. So if Jesus Christ is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek, why would we think that Jesus is going to do anything different in our lives? Then receive our offerings, and then do what? Bless. I bless you. I bless you. You're sick in your body? I bless you. And the children came unto Jesus in the Gospels. The disciples were upset about it. What did he do? He blessed them. And there's never a time in the gospel someone came to him sick and said, you know what? You need to bring glory to God. I'm going to make you sicker. 
He blessed them. By what? Healing them. He is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Verse 7, and without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. But if you'll have eyes to see, if you'll have ears to hear, the lesser is only blessed by the greater if you live like Abraham and tithe. See, it's only true if you take action. Verse 8, in the one case, the tenth is collected by men who die, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. And so he says in the other case, well, what case is that? It's the new covenant. In the other case, in the case of the new covenant, the tenth, the tithe, is collected by him who is declared to be living. Well, who is that? Who is declared to be living? Who did they torture? Who did they put a crown of thorns upon his head? Who did they whip? Who did they crucify? Who did they put in the grave? And three days later, he came up out of the grave. Who is declared to be living? Jesus. And he does in our lives what Melchizedek did in Abraham's life. So we could say it this way, reading verse 8. In the other case, in the case of the new covenant, the tenth, the tithe, is collected by Jesus Christ, who lives forever. Number four, we'll wrap it up here. Jesus is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek, not Aaron or Levi. Hebrews 7, beginning in verse 9. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham. Because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. So once again, we see conceptually, whether you're a physical descendant of Abraham or in Christ Jesus, a spiritual descendant of Abraham, we're to live like he lived. Verse 11, if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, why was there still a need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aram. For when there is a change of priesthood, there must also be a change of law. He of whom these things are said belonged to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah. He was a king, first of all. He descended from Judah. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. See, and the Bible tells us the same spirit that indwells Christ indwells you. The power of an indestructible life. Where's that power at work? In your life, in your home, in your family. See, just knowing this information will cause you to lift up your eyes. Verse 17, for it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it is not without an oath. Others become priests without any oath. But he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Better. Say better. better. Tell your neighbor, say better. better. So when you go to the Old Testament and you see good stuff, God's got better for us because of what Jesus did through the new covenant. When you go to the old covenant and there are incredible miracles, God has got better for us under the new covenant. When you go to the old covenant, you see like somebody like Abraham blessed, God has got better for us under the new covenant. We've just got to lift up our eyes to see it and to say it's ours, it belongs to us. Verse 23, now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing office but Jesus, because he lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. He's able to save completely in every single area of your life. Total well-being. Verse 26, we see he's holy. He's blameless. He's pure. He's set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens, and then you look down in verse 27, he sacrificed for their sins, for our sins, once for all when he offered, when he, once for all when he offered himself. Now skip down to chapter 8, verse 1. The point of what we are saying is this, we do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Now skip down to verse 6. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs. Who's that? Levi, Aaron, the old covenant. 
is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old, and it is founded on better promises. So it's better, it's better, it's better, it's superior, it's superior, superior. But you have got Christians running around talking as if God's covenant with us as Christians is lesser and more bad. It's worse than what the level that the patriarchs walked in in the Old Testament. And that is stupid. Because we see here that our covenant is better and we have better promises. And you even hear the thing of somebody say, oh, well, that's a promise in the Old Covenant. Okay, let me burst that bubble. And we'll end with this. 2 Corinthians 1.20. Paul says, all of God's promises are yes in Christ. So if you go to his word and it's a promise, it doesn't matter what page it's in. It doesn't matter what book it's in. It doesn't matter what chapter it is, what verse it is. Paul says that because of Jesus and because of what Jesus did for us, that all the promises of God's word, Genesis to Revelation, you want to know what God's will is? Blessing. You want to know what, if he's saying, he's saying yes, all of his promises are yes in Christ Jesus. Does he want you saved? Yes. Does he want you set free? Yes. Does he want you to be healed? Yes. Does he want you to have more than enough? Does he want you to be blessed? Yes. 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 And so the good news is that when we, like Abraham, come to our high priest Jesus and we obey him, we present our offerings to him, it's not Aaron saying bless you. It's not Levi saying bless you. And Melchizedek, as good as he was, as great as he was, it's not even Melchizedek saying bless you. I mean, just, oh my goodness, just, just close your eyes and imagine that Jesus himself, bless you, bless you, bless you. Got to lift up our eyes. Your best days are ahead of you. Amen.